Today is the fifth day of February 2015, and we are continuing our series on Savitri with Dr. Alok Pandey. Alok, Namaskar. Mother told Udar, Savitri is a mantra for the transformation of the world. Where do we begin? <laughs> <coughs> Actually, this is where we had stopped. Yeah. The transformation begins with release from ignorance. Yes. Yes. <laughs> I think that's the first fundamental step. Because uh, if we remain stuck in the mud of ignorance, then you know it remains like an idle dream. So it's very interesting, last time we read these two cantos in book mm -hmm. one. And then suddenly we see this shift. First two cantos and prepare a background. Very interesting shift. Yeah. Very interesting shift. And in between that shift, the secret knowledge. Yes, the secret oh. knowledge. So the shift is, <coughs> actually, the can, there, there is a, you know, in book eight we see only canto three. Mm -hmm. So it continues with book one, canto one, canto two. It's almost like the logical continuation. The day Savitri wakes up and then she goes to the forest where Satyavan dies. Death in the forest. But then uh, the rest up till that point is like a flashback. So what led to Savitri's coming? Two, three things which are very interesting which I find. One, you know, when we speak about avatars, the coming of the divine descents, uh, almost invariably, at least in Indian tradition where avatars are so much talked about, you know, we speak of avatars of Vishnu and they are primarily uh, the masculine aspect of the divine. Yes. But there have been avatars which have represented the aspects of the divine mother. They, they are known. But so, for some, some reason they have been in the background. For instance, Draupadi. Draupadi is known to be an avatar of Kali, Helen of Troy. Mm. Shabinda speaks of that. And yes. when Helen suddenly says, it is good that the whole Troy is destroyed, it's very powerful, you know. It's not a human speech at all. It's a speech of something divine. But they have never been made prominent. <coughs> and for the first time we see Shabinda bringing that to the forefront. And whenever the feminine avatars have come, they have brought very, very revolutionary changes. We know, you know, many past lives of the mother. Yes. Uh, and it's a very healthy, welcome and happy change that Sri brings out the feminine aspect as the avatar. The second thing which is very interesting is that there is a foreground and a background to the avatars coming. There is a field of preparation, a work which has to be done. So we see before Christ comes, there is, you know, a proclamation about Christ coming and a kind of preparation that takes place. This preparation is at a twofold level, one a positive one, second a negative one, where people feel oppressed more and more and they wait for the advent. And there is also a positive one where there is prophecy that someone is going to come who will be like a redeemer. We see it in the story of Krishna. We see it in the story of Rama. And, and John the Baptist. And John the Baptist. That's it. That's yes. what I was yes. referring to. Exactly. And now with Savitri, we Shubhendra starts with that very powerful line. A world's desire compelled her mortal birth. So, you know, it's a very powerful line. That the anguish and the aspiration of a world we have a similar story in Ramayana where Sita is born because of the anguish of the sages and the seers. And all their anguish and pain and you know desire for something greater and higher and nobler and purer is kept in the earth in the form of their blood because they have been killed by Ravana. And it is King Janaka who finds that pot full of blood which has transformed itself into a uh, lady, into a girl, a baby girl. So it's a very symbolic story. Obviously, I mean, it's not a physical event. 
So we see something very similar that a world's desire compelled her mortal birth. So in one line he summarizes. And then what follows is a long journey of Ashupati and Ashupati is the forerunner who comes to prepare for her descent. After all, if the spaces are not ready, how will the work go on? And, and, and it's interesting that there's just one line about it. One her. line, very powerful. You know, some of the lines of Sri are so power-packed, they conjure a whole world of meaning. And this is one of those lines, a world's desire. <coughs> it seems that everything that human beings have experienced, every anguish, every pain, every, uh, every breath, which is a breath of life and a breath of death, every pang of nature, all nature dumbly calls to her alone. Every failure, every success, every change of season goes eventually into the great coming. The world's desire is unqualified. Yeah. So it's something very powerful, very wonderful. But she will come. Where is the field? And that's where we see in Mother and Shurbindo's own life that how Shurbindo actually prepared the field for the mother's coming. And uh, at one level, of course, Mother's Yoga was a very silent yoga. Very few people knew about it. Theo knew and his wife knew and some people in her immediate vicinity. But Sri Yoga, obviously partly the Indian sensitivity and they were aware. And then when he withdrew to Pondicherry that something special is happening. But two things which strike us. One, you see why the feminine aspect of the divine when they come as avatars, why they are not in the forefront. So in one of the places the mother says, let me remain in the background, let them worship thee to thy heart's, their heart's content. Because they work, they give themselves to the work. And the second thing which strikes is when Sri prepares the field through the Arya, through a small group of disciples, and of course those famous letters, the mother, the, the very first letter which was written basically as a message, the book, to, the to mother. A, to a devotee. Yeah. No, the first letter was just a message oh. on 21st February 1927. So soon after the mother was established as the, in the forefront of the ashram as to who she is. And then two, three, four are written to, uh, two, three, four, five are written to, uh, in fact, three, four, five are written to Punam Chand, a devotee. And the second also partly was written to Punam Chand, but it was enlarged. And six is a standalone. Some say that it was written in response to TV Kapali Shastri, but nevertheless a standalone. So if he wouldn't have established the mother in the forefront, things would have been perhaps different. But this is where we see the yoga of Ashupati, which very often we draw a parallel with Sri yoga. That the yoga ends with the coming of the Divine Mother and accepting the burden. Yes. So, you know, she takes, enters into a mortal birth, takes that mortal atmosphere, the mortal breath, and then she begins to work in a field which Sri and the mother are preparing. Sri primarily prepares the field and the mother comes to fulfill it. That's why we see that the whole descent and subsequent to the supramental descent, the whole journey. And uh, Sri primarily, he had the same realization, but it was the mother which who had to fulfill it. And that's why Sri says before leaving, you will have to fulfill yes. our yoga of transformation. Yes. Yes. So she comes to fulfill. And that's what we see in Savitri, that the yoga of Ashupati is like a great preparation, a glimpse and a preparation of humanity and an in, in, <coughs> invocation for a coming. And the first step to this yoga is release from ignorance. I think it's the first fundamental step. In this second line where Sri Aurobindo admits yes. in his humility yes. that he is in the front of, of the, the immemorial, immemorial quest. quest. So he has to represent within himself the ascending and the descending truths. Yes. Yes. 
and they have toiled for ages for this day. So ignorance, you know, this word is a very interesting word and this canto yoga of the soul's release, the yoga of the king, very often at least uh, people have a tendency to interpret it as Raj Yoga because of the word king. But it's not that at all. <laughs> it's a yoga which goes beyond all limits of all the yogas when we read through it. And uh, uh, the interesting part is that ignorance, again, very often we use this word very casually and loosely. Meaning by ignorance, uh, illiteracy or lack of education, lack of degrees. And this is a very interesting story. <coughs> the word is used in a very specific way in the Indian thought. And Shubhendra draws uh, from that. Um, when Anandamai Ma, somebody went to meet her and he had a big card with all the degrees. Uh, PhD, Harvard, DLIT. So the person, her secretary didn't know how to read all this. So he said, mother, somebody very uh, Vidwan, Vidwan is knowledgeable, has come to see you. So she made a very interesting remark that how come there is some knowledgeable person in this land of ignorance? So <laughs> now this land of ignorance is a very interesting phenomenon. And I think Plato has spoken about people being tied and looking at shadows on the wall, but to make it more simple, we live inside a room. We read previously, this world is a jail. The material universe is like a jail. Now why it is a jail? Because it doesn't allow us to see beyond the obscure walls of matter. We don't see. We, we know, we have been told, we have faith, or we may doubt that there is a divine presence behind, but we don't see. So we are still in the three-dimensional world. It's a trap. Now, inside this room, we have certain objects which somehow have come into being. We don't know who kept them there or whether there was somebody or not. And we play with those objects. We try to understand them. And inside this room, we may understand everything about every object, how it works by opening it, reassembling it, even, you know, improvise upon it. By If we have the material, we can improvise upon it. And yet, we are ignorant if we have not opened the door and seen what lies beyond. And beyond are sun fields, sun belts of knowledge and moon belts of delight. delight. So this is the ignorance where we identify ourselves with a limited consciousness. And that limited consciousness is the consciousness of our mind, vital and the body. So when we are identified with it, we are in a state of ignorance. But knowledge is when we emerge out of that and we begin to experience the real, the real world, unlike what people normally say, this is the real world and that is an illusion. But when one experiences that, that's much more concrete and real. And this is almost and this illusion. is almost an illusion <laughs> because it's so vast. Imagine you know stepping out of this room and being under the vast sky with its wonderful panorama, the ocean, the birds, the trees. Then where is this room? A small little place, a fragment and a residue. Shivinda uses that yes, word. Yes. Our earth is a fragment and a residue. Yes. So this freedom that comes. Now the interesting part is in the third canto there are several movements by which or not by which but you know the freedom has been described. What is that state of freedom? The state of consciousness, its effect upon Ashupati mm. and then how it tends to grow inside till there is a complete freedom. Then in canto 5 what is the next step? That's where Ashupati's yoga or we may say Shurabindu's yoga begins to depart from traditional yoga. Yes. In traditional yoga you have glimpses of this beyond the mind states. And one is very happy. One can go into samadhi in each of these states of higher consciousness, higher world, illumined world, intuitive mind and eventually withdraw. But in Shurabindu's yoga when he gets freed from ignorance 
I mean, this ignorance was a self-imposed ignorance in his case. He discovers a greater world of splendor and delight and knowledge waiting to come down. And that's where the whole journey begins to change. And the discovery of both these worlds are beautifully given in the secret knowledge. Yes. So, you know, very often people have a tendency to read records of yoga and uh, to say, oh, these are Shurabindu's experiences. Of course they are. But uh, read by an unchaste mind and all of us have an unchaste mind without a corresponding experience, we may be misled. Whereas when we read Savitri, he has not only packed those experiences with a amazing, uh, you know, mantric power, it also helps us to come out into that state. So, the very fact that we read this canto, it helps us to come out of a mental prison because suddenly he gives us a glimpse of what lies beyond. And just see, some of these states are amazing. <coughs> And there's the eighth line that hooks up with the first line. Yes. Brought down to, to earth's earth. dumb need her radiant power. Yes, so he did absolutely. it. He brought it. He brought it. And then, you know, how he brought it down, all that is, you know, paying here God's debt to earth and man. So yeah. he bring, he comes to pay the debt. And we have read about, we we'll read about that debt in Canto 4. Yes. A mutual debt. So when earth comes, it's already, she has accepted the challenge and the, of the transformation. So the divine knows it, acknowledges it, and comes time to time to pay back the debt so that it can evolve into a greater vision and glory. Then of course on page 23 we have a, a beautiful description of the psychic being when he talks about this bodily appearance is not all. So, just as, you know, Ashupati, the king, is a mask, translucent mask. But what hides behind Ashupati is the glory of the infinite. So too, now here, you know, Shivinda is bringing a very deep Vedantic truth. So too, we are all masks. And hid in us is a seed of that glory. And that seed is the psychic being. <coughs> when Mother was asked, Mother, are you God? She gave a lovely reply. She said that question could be asked of any of us. And the answer would be potentially yes. And it is our work to make this true in our life. And our birthright. Our, it's our birthright. So we see this line describing the psychic being. The form deceives. The person is a mask. Hid deep in man, celestial powers can dwell. Now these powers will be described later on. His fragile ship conveys through the sea of years an incognito of the imperishable. The one who is a true identity we don't know. So it's incognito. It is there. It is indestructible. It doesn't die. It doesn't perish with the form. We don't know it. It has no name. His fragile ship, the human yes, form, the human, human body. form, the body. And then these lines, a spirit that is a flame of God abides. A fiery portion of the wonderful artist of his own beauty and delight. Immortal in our mortal poverty. So all that we believe is, you know, the true richness is the richness of the soul. And all the qualities that emerge from it, compassion, fidelity, true love, faith, all these are powers of the soul. That makes a man's life rich. Otherwise, it's a mortal poverty. You know, we may have everything and yet. Yes. So here he gives a hint that how this seed grows and grows till a time comes and it goes through many many layers and levels you know the, the other day we were talking about the evolutionary story even the evolution of the form which is there in Indian thought especially the Tantra <coughs> we see here 
in the mute strength of the occult idea already within us there is a blueprint of what we are going to be occult idea mute strength we do not speak about it no. we do not know it do not recognize it determining predestined shape and act passenger from life to life from scale to scale changing his imaged self from form to form he regards the icon growing by his gaze and in the warm foresees the coming god what more hope there can be yeah. if there is the god god had hidden hidden in the warm which manifests over here is the proof the evidence that man will go further we don't need anything else so shubhendra says the supramental is inevitable in the very logic of things yeah. we don't have to even take any word for granted it's inevitable the whole process of evolution if it has to have a sense and a purpose is itself a document of god and he calls it a thing decreed a thing decreed and you see how beautifully he reconciles creationism and evolutionary <laughs> thought which are unfortunately you know uh, are seen as antagonists to each other you see the occult idea uh, what is really in creationism that everything has been already created the truth is on a subtle level it has been created it's like the occult idea and it manifests so manifest through evolution that's why when we dream we go into certain worlds and see creatures and there are many such forms which are yet to come that's why man sometimes dreams of them imagines them and they will manifest in a process of time and what would you say of the idea of predestination yes it is the soul that chooses the event and circumstance for its growth it doesn't choose based on i'll be comfortable i'll be happy well it will be happy and comfortable but in a different way not just with physical comfort but when it finds the divine mother's lap it will be happy and comfortable so it chooses that path which will lead it yes. towards that like a river rushing towards the sea so predestined act we think this circumstance that circumstance but as he says an and k is one son decree yeah. we decide we choose but not this we which we regard as ourselves but something much deeper so and then of course this journey continues and um, it where does it end with a complete identification of the divine and that's why we see on the next page <clears throat> in the creature the unveiled creatrix works even now she works next page page 24 even now she works but she works in a veiled way she works through the lower nature and so the lower nature invariably distorts the promptings from within the divine will gets deviated into various forms of desire the energy is lost and wasted the mother said so many times that so many times i have given you the energy for progress for transformation for healing but invariably man wastes it and she is taken pain away and suffering away and we allowed to come back we call it back she even talks about when somebody was in a state of position and how she drove away that yeah. Yeah. seed of vanity yes but the person suddenly felt that he is nobody and nothing what wants to be special and extraordinary <laughs> and that's why one called back the madness so she says it's not that one cannot drive away but man is open so readily the first thing that man does with his freedom not freedom independence the, the mother is, makes a distinction between the two yeah is to make a pact with the forces of the vital world this is how she describes in the agenda man was given this independence to choose but he invariably makes a pact with the vital worlds 
and opens the door to his disaster. That's why we have a long dim preparation which is described later. But right now, in the creature, the unveiled creatrix works. Her face is seen through his face, her eyes through his eyes. Her being is his through a vast identity. Then is revealed in man the overt divine. This is our work. As he says, the work of works. This is the divine life. <coughs> to live divinely, to think divinely, to act divinely, to feel divinely. Right now we live within the human frame or maybe the human animal frame. And then look at this, showing those two sides, the Vedantic and the Tantra side, the static and the dynamic side. A static oneness and dynamic power descend in him, the integral Godhead's seals, his soul and body take that splendid stamp. Shobindo describes, peace is the sign of the divine presence, that is the static sign, and Ananda, the sign of the divine mother's play. So, so beautifully. <laughs> so the static side brings peace, liberation, yes. and the dynamic side brings Ananda and new creation. So we have the Shiobindo and the mother, <coughs> and the touch, and then he describes what a long preparation human life is, and then he connects it in a beautiful way until at last is reached the giant point. So we go through several layers of evolutionary degrees until we reach that point through which his glory shines for whom we were made. Look at this line, the giant point. <laughs> How can a point be gigantic? Now, you know, this is the beauty of the yeah. divine mathematics. The psychic is no bigger than the thumb of man. Yes. And yet, it alone has the capacity to put us in touch with the universal being who dwells in all. Shouldn't that another place in Secret Knowledge also describes it as a fathomless point. Yes. It's a point. So we narrow, 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 enter into it and we touch it. But when we touch it, amazingly we become aware of the same point in this whole creation. And on one of Champaglal's birthdays, yes. he sent him this message, which is so beautiful. A veil behind the, the heart, a lid Above over the, the mind, keep us from the divine. Love and devotion rend the veil, and in the quietude of the mind, the lid thins and vanishes. That's it. Oh. That's what is being described. And we break into the infinity of God. So this is freedom from ignorance. Yes. Limitation is ignorance. Even a limited idea of the divine, conception of the divine, ideals, various walls and fragments which we, uh, through which we cut off the utter unity of that, is ignorance. We may reach a very high state, but as long as there are divisions, we are still in ignorance. It's a different thing that whether we are in a smaller room or a bigger room, but yes. see, ignorance all the same. <laughs> so, across our nature's borderline, we escape into supernatures, arc of living light. Look at this line, living light. It's a splendid light. This now was witnessed in that sun of force. So here we see, and of course the meaning of the word Ashwapati comes uh, prominently now. Ashwapati is the lord of tapasya and Ashwa literally is force. He is a tapasvi. So tapasvis, they use a tremendous will and by that will they ascend to greater and greater degrees of consciousness. So that son of force, yeah. he has embodied that power inside him, the power of tapas, 
with which he is ascending. So Shubhendra uses sometimes very interesting phrases. Yes. He is not using a traditional word tapasvi. Yes. This now was witnessed in that tapasvi. Witnessed. Witnessed in that son of false. Anyone, By his tapas he has brought it out. Anyone could see it. That's it. So, and then, uh, you know, there are descriptions of states of this higher consciousness which are very interesting. And we'll just read just a few of them. That what happens? <clears throat> so on page 26, we have some very interesting lines. Yes. I've read this passage over and over again. It is why don't so you beautiful. why don't you read it? It's no, it, tremendous. It, yeah, it's fine. We can read it. From here? Yeah. It's it's powerful. As so he grew into his larger self, humanity framed his movements less and less. A greater being saw a greater world. Now, Mother has spoken about this whole passage and she has said this is how those with a new consciousness, the new being, the new man, he will have these things very naturally within him. So all that Ashwapati is experiencing are faculties and capacities which will they will be natural to the Superman. <coughs> so we, we can't pretend to be Superman. <laughs> it is <laughs> something which is... But it's such a description yeah. of, of his growth into the recognition of his avatar. Yes. Where shall I read? Even his first steps broke out. <coughs> Even his first steps. Even his first steps broke our small earth bounds and loitered in a vaster, freer air. In hands sustained by a transfiguring might, he caught up lightly like a giant's bow left slumbering in a sealed and secret cave, the powers that sleep unused in man within. In the psychic cave where they are lying dormant, yes. in matter's depths where they are lying dormant. Yes. Yes. He made of miracle a, common, a normal act and turned to a common part of divine works Magnificently natural at this height, efforts that would shatter the strength of mortal hearts, pursued in a royalty of mighty ease, aims too sublime for nature's daily will. The gifts of the spirit crowding came to him. They were his life's pattern and his privilege. A pure perception lent its lucent joy. Shubhendu speaks of this perception in Alipur jail. He says, suddenly my eyes were unsealed to the sense of beauty hidden behind everything. And look at it where? In the jail. Is this when he sees Vasudev in everything? Yes, yes. And yes. he also had this sudden vision of beauty in everything. And he says that everything began to appear. So pure perception. Our perception is distorted. We see the mass and we react. And it's a lucent joy. Lucent joy. Its intimate vision waited not to think. It enveloped all nature in a single glance. It looked into the very self of things. Deceived no more by form, he saw the soul. In beings, it knew what lurked to them unknown. It sees the idea in mind, the wish in the heart. It plucked out from gray folds of secrecy the motives which from their own sight men hide. So many examples in <coughs> Shobindo and the mother's life. And some of them are very funny also, where somebody had a particular intent and the mother would know it yes. 
and also the other which people were not aware and they would say no mother no mother and she would say no you don't know and much later the person would come to know that yes this was my need which i was not aware so this degree of going into the very depths when you mention that i have a, a personal story right it was a time in oroville in those earliest days when everyone wanted to do things organically and we had problems with insects and disease fungus i wrote a two page single space <coughs> typewritten letter to mother about the organic gardening and shamsunda read the first line and mother said stop i know everything he's going to say <laughs> tell him he may use chemicals on the flowers what a shock to orville and she completely changed my understanding of this life that one does what is needed to yes. do for the health of the earth as you might have to take certain medicines and absolutely. drugs absolutely absolutely to keep the body going and But she uh, knew everything i was going to say the yes, whole yes and also days. at a point of time what is needed yes and this itself changes as we grow as things grow yes Chamal Lal ji also told me a very interesting story because <clears throat> I used to have this dilemma for a long time: should I talk or should I not speak? So many people would call, and uh, mm. I had many indications that this is one of the work. But you know, the ego can deceive us in so many ways, uh, especially when there were calls from for going abroad. So uh, Chamal Lal ji, very interestingly, without knowing this. he told me a story now look at it how mother works so he said you know when i had to go abroad once uh, i asked the mother what shall i do should i go or not is something to this effect but this is it the essence is the same is is true so the mother said do you want to go so he said no mother i will go if you want me to go so the mother wrote back are you sure now you know that he says i looked very carefully inside me <laughs> and i said mother with whatever consciousness i can see in, inside myself i don't see that i have an ambition to go i mean i cannot see but you know best <laughs> then of course he sanctioned she said yes you go you should go it's a work to be done but look how uh, she could see deep inside even things which are lurking somewhere like traces and finish them off and then give the work so human nature is like that yes. ignorance is like that but this beautiful section yes he felt the beating life in other men invade him with their happiness and their grief their love their anger their unspoken hopes entered in currents or in pouring waves into the immobile ocean of his calm from far he could sense so many things and the stories of shirdindo's interventions yes much far away yes. Yes. some stories which are amazing even a servant boy who suddenly sees shirdindo come to him because the owners who were devotees had gone away and they were bit worried you know in our absence if everything will be safe and the servant suddenly you see sometimes the, the we have a uh, very strange way of judging people but look his opening he says why are you worried you have baba ji here so you should not be worried <laughs> so <laughs> he will take care of the house only i think people who have not gone through this mental education are psychically open and that is the real value so he goes and when he comes back when they come back they asked everything is okay he said yes uh, and baba ji came and he asked me if everything is fine he even sat on the bed and inquired and then went away <laughs> so you see how the divine takes care and can far and near loses its meaning yes. when we enter into that fourth dimension all together time and space collapse and change there yes. 
And mother speaks of her body. Yes. Feeling yes. the pain here in New York City. <coughs> yes. Oh. The hemorrhage. Yes. People doing something. So many things. Yes. In it. Life is a very different life altogether. We are closed in a thick box and we feel ourselves free. That's the irony. <laughs> I want to ask you after about these two lines. Yes. He heard the inspired sound of his own thoughts re-echoed in the vault of other minds. Is there a place where he speaks of Churchill? Not only that, he used to, Shurbindo used to, as we know now, would listen to the speech and he would say that, look here, he received the inspirations very well. That's what I thought. So, it is he who was actually sending all the messages and what he should speak and he was just an instrument and there are so many other stories when people said, what am I going to say? <coughs> you don't have to say anything. Udar recounts such a story. Yes. You don't say anything. You just be open to me. I will speak through you. So, of course, Churchill's story is a very famous one. He himself mm -hmm. felt a hand of God. Yes. Not knowing from where and why. And, and the other part of that story is that the divine does not pick up instruments based on moral judgment of things, but on receptivity, on the substance, on something else, which is not connected to our surface natures. I mean, Churchill was far from being a moralist, yes. and yet he was a chosen instrument. Aurobindo Basu once showed me a letter from Mother. He had written to Mother, and he said, Mother, it seems that more and more Sri Aurobindo is speaking through me, and they are his words. And Mother wrote back, the more you unite with him, yes. the more he will speak through you. Yes, that's it. And the best way to unite is through love. She says, who can understand Sri Aurobindo? Yes. Yes. So I think we'll stop with three, four lines, which <coughs> finish this movement, his inner self grew near to others' selves. You see, this, this, this brings true compassion. At one point, uh, uh, you know, somebody who was very keen to take up Sri yoga and Sri kept refusing. So the disciple asks, I forget whether it was Champaklalji or someone else, asked Sri why are you refusing him? It's in evening talks. He's so keen. He wants. So Shubindu says, it is out of compassion that I am refusing it. He will break down if he takes up this yoga. So you see, even Chitranjan Das, he said no, who had fought for him. He wanted the yoga. He said no, this yoga is not for you. But wherever you are, you can call me and I'll help you. But because, and he asked why, he said, you will break down. Your body will not be able to take it. So, what is that divine vision which is able to understand the entire <laughs> history, geography and chemistry and physics of this earth from a spiritual and occult perspective? Yes. And bore a kinship's weight, a common tie, yet stood untouched, king of itself, alone. So I think we'll just take a little break here.